Hello everyone and welcome to our lecture on water. Um, we're going to be, I've kind of thrown a few things in here. Uh, we're going to talk about glaciers, uh, we're going to talk about groundwater, um, and some things like that. So um, those two things aren't related other than they involve water. Uh, first of all though, let's talk about glaciers because uh, glaciers are essential um, in understanding geology. Um, if you're doing geology anywhere in New England or the Midwest or somewhere like that, you've got to understand that that area used to be covered with ice. Otherwise, nothing's going to make sense. And I'll talk more about that later. If you're in Florida even, uh, no, we were not directly affected by glaciers. But as we'll see, our paleontology uh, was considerably um affected by glaciers and so we really we really do need to understand what's going on here and so what what and, and what you see here um is a picture i took a couple summers ago um in the um uh the uh, uh columbia ice fields um in british columbia canada uh of the atabasca glacier which is a a really pretty glacier that is rapidly disappearing um as you hike up to the glacier they have signs along the way saying you know in 1980 the glacier was here and you can't even see the glacier from there and then you know in 1985 it was here and gradually back and back and back and back and so what you see here is sort of a remnant um of the uh of, of an originally much larger glacier and that's true just about everywhere there's a couple places where glaciers are growing but I can think of one, Mount Shasta, but that's it. Every, everywhere else, they're 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 retreating. So um, so what is a glacier? Well, a glacier is a body of ice that is flowing down slope. They're really kind of fascinating. Um, what happens here is you know you get uh, snow, uh, and if you have an area where there is more snowfall in the winter than you have melting back in the summer, that snow will accumulate and will pack. And it will gradually turn into one body of ice. Um, and then ice under these conditions will flow. Not quickly, but it will flow. Uh, there's a certain class of material called a rayoid, which is something that appears solid. Hold on, I need a drink of water. Which is something that appears solid. But will uh, is is actually flowing, just very slowly, um, and incidentally, glass is one of these things. Now, I doubt there's any glass in your day in day out life that you know you you could see this in. But if you ever go to a really old house, like a revolutionary war era house right or go to england and find a really old house with the original glass not replaced later on but glass that's been there for one or two hundred years look carefully at it and it will be thicker uh, uh, like a window pane right sorry i didn't really say that did i look at the window pane original glass if it is original glass, it'll be thicker at the bottom than it is at the top because it is gradually flowing. And in, in this case, you can't, you know, it takes hundreds of years to, to actually see it, but it is. Ice will do the same thing. Given enough time, given enough pressure, given enough all those geology things, right? Time and pressure and stuff like that. It'll actually flow. Okay, now there is another way that ice moves though. Um, we, when we think about uh, glaciers, uh, we can think about two different kinds with respect to their movement, uh, wet bottom and dry bottom. And so uh, dry bottom is kind of what I was just talking about, right? Wherein the ice is, you know, basically frozen to the ground and the movement of the glacier is the movement of the, the flow of that body of ice over that rock. Sometimes, though, you'll get a wet bottom glacier. A wet bottom glacier, uh, you know, it has, well, water at the bottom of it, right? Well, if, if, it's, if you have water at the bottom of it, you can see how you're going to get, you know, lubrication here, right? You're going to get this slurry of water and sediment, some of it quite fine because it's been ground uh, into silt by the glacier. And so you get this muddy slurry at the bottom of the glacier. And you, you, now you, you can see how 
you know, that's gonna that's gonna slide, right? It's, it's just gonna slide, and we call that basal sliding, right? Um, dry bottom glaciers, where where you know uh, you're moving by the the deformation of the ice, tend to move very slowly, relatively slowly. Wet bottom glaciers can slip a few feet in, you know. A couple of minutes uh so you know you want to be mm, kind of careful uh when you're messing around with these wet bottom glaciers because conditions can change very very quickly um when we think about glaciers in general though there are two kinds um alpine or mountain glaciers and continental glaciers right there are and, and let me let me show you let me show you on google earth so i'm going to get out of this for a second and i'm going to fire up google earth here i got it ready to go um okay so if we look um if we want to see alpine glaciers right the easiest best place to go here is alaska Right, and we can see, you know, the mountains of Alaska, and we can see, oh, there's some good ones, right? We can see ice, you know, literally, eh, where some some that aren't washed out by the photography. Hold on, there, there we go, there, there, that, there we go. Okay, so so we can see this ice just flowing down out of these mountains, right? There's 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 a nice glacier. There's a nice glacier. Here's some good ones, here's some good ones, right? And you can even see, if I zoom in a lot, you can see what we'll learn are called moraines. These rows of sediment um, on top of the glacier as it erodes away the, the walls of these valleys. And so these are alpine glaciers. And if I zoom out again, you can know, you'll notice that there's an awful lot of glacially carved valley <laughs> Here's a nice one without any glacier in it, right? This, this, you know, once again, you know, we don't need photographs from 150 and 25 years ago to see that glaciers are retreating just about, here's some good ones, just about everywhere, right? There used to be a glacier in here and it is utterly and completely gone. As we'll learn, there's an easy way to tell glacial valleys from stream carved valleys and these are glacial valleys. So, so um, you know, part of our glacial story is uh, that they are retreating. Uh, this this is due to global climate change, uh, people pumping carbon dioxide into the air, making the, the, the air warmer. The other thing to keep in mind about glaciers, and we won't go into this too much because it's not really us, um, not really. But anyway, glaciers keep the planet cool because glaciers are white and they reflect sunlight because they're white and so uh sunlight that is reflected isn't turned into heat and so glaciers not only exist because the planet is relatively cool they keep the planet relatively cool so as they melt back the, that makes the planet warmer which makes the glaciers melt back which makes the planet warmer and you can see how we're in this what we would call a positive feedback loop where something happens that makes the thing happen even more right uh and so this is you know this is a problem you know overall you know global climate change has resulted in an i don't know an average increase of i don't know um one and a half i think degrees celsius on average across the planet at the poles it's five because of these glaciers and sea ice. Sea ice is the same thing. Sea ice is frozen seawater, not frozen snow, or not snow turned into ice. But uh, that sea ice also keeps the planet warm. As we lose sea ice, that warms the planet, which makes more sea ice melt, and you can see how that works. Okay, anyway, these are alpine glaciers, or mountain glaciers. Um, and then if we come over here to Greenland, right, uh, greatest bit of advertising in the world. You have a country that is covered in snow. What do you name it? Greenland. Get people to move there. Um, covered in glacier. Right? And you know the the thing about uh, this is a continental glacier. And the thing about continental glaciers, of course, if if I if I zoom into the middle, it just looks like that. Right? But if I look if I look on the edges, you can definitely see the flow. Uh, you can definitely see the flow out of the center, uh, and you can see all this valley here that used to have glacier, glacier in it that doesn't anymore. These flooded, empty glacial valleys. This is sea ice, right? This is not glacier. That's frozen seawater. That's different. But but clearly, you know, as we look at the world's glaciers, almost all of them are retreating at a prodigious rate uh, due to uh, due to global climate change. But right now, what we want to get is this is a continental glacier, right? Um, big old slab of ice sitting on top of a continent as opposed to an alpine glacier. <laughs> alpine glaciers 
get north back up, uh, that are there because, you know, the mountain is at such an altitude that you can, uh, that, you know, ice will accumulate, right? And so um, a lot of uh, the initial work with glaciers was done um, in France. Uh, and so when we get to some terminology, uh, it's going to be French. Uh, sorry about that. Nothing I can do about them. But anyway, okay, let's go back to PowerPoint. Uh, let me let me get it so we're there, and let me uh, do this so that you can see the whole thing. And there we go. So alpine and continental glaciers. Now, what about this movement? Well, glaciers move. Um, uh, you know, once again, they can move by sliding along the bottom if they're a wet bottom, or they can move by the plastic deformation of the ice if they're a dry bottom. Um, but when we, when we think about glaciers moving, you know, that rate can vary a lot from, you know, 10 to 300, uh, you know, meters a year. So, you know, uh, three football fields possibly a year. So that, that's, that's pretty, um, pretty, um, pretty fast actually. <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, people like to talk about, you know, the glacial pace of something or something like that to a geologist that's pretty good. I mean, <laughs> that's actually pretty fast. Um, every now and then, if it slides, you could move 100 meters a day. And you want to be careful when that happens, right? You don't want to be on that glacier when it's moving like that. Um, you know, as with anything that is flowing, uh, there's a few things that are going to go into how fast this glacier moves, right? First of all, as with like a river, right? This the the, the slope angle, right? If, if, if it's flowing down a steeper slope, it's going to move faster. Uh, if, if the slope is not so much, it's going to move slower. It's just, this is gravity, y'all, right? Simple enough. We already talked about a wet versus dry bottom glaciers, right? Wet bottom glaciers can move a lot faster. That's that, that's that hundred meters a day, right? Let me move to my, let me switch to my, um, switch to my laser pointer. Uh, you know, that's the hundred meters a day is those dry bottom glaciers, right? Um, it, I'm sorry, sorry, wet bottom glaciers right the dry bottom ones are just moving by plastic flow that's going to be the you know 10 to you know you know 20 50 100 meters a year that that's where that's coming from the other thing that matters though and people do this a lot um they'll go out and they'll just put markers across the glacier and then they come back in a year and look at and see where they are and in Inevitably, the markers in the middle of the glacier have moved faster uh, than the markers on the edge, right? The markers on the edge, you know, that ice is stuck to that canyon wall. It's not going to move that much, right? Um, on the other hand, the markers in the middle are further from that canyon wall, and they're going to move, you know, a lot faster. And so, you know, if you if you bore a drill hole down into glaciers, and there's a lot of good reasons to do that. We learn a lot about climate by drilling glaciers. Um, you know, that borehole is going to get deformed in, in, you know, a year or so. Um, and, you know, once again, your markers uh, are going to show a lot faster movement in the middle of the glacier than they are on the outside. By the way, rivers are like this too. Rivers move a lot faster in the middle than they do on the edges for the same reason. The drag up against the... Um, up against the shoreline in the case of a river and so if we look at a cross section through a glacier we can see that yeah you know in the middle it might be moving 50 meters per year but on the edges it's only moving 10 or 20 and faster as you go in right and once again it's stuck to the edge of the canyon so it's not going to move that fast okay so let's think a little bit more though about glacial advance and retreat so we already talked about how um you know you've got you know more snow falling in the winter than you have melting back in the summer that is fundamentally what makes a glacier right now you can however have glacial ice in areas that are just not that cold right they're going to get pushed in there so so you know here's how this works right you get this area up here where you do have, you know, more snow falling in the winter than you have melting back in the summer. It's, you know, if it's an alpine glacier, it's higher up in the mountains, right? If it's a continental glacier, the continent is just far enough north that it'll do this, right? And so, um, and so this is called the zone of accumulation, right? This is where, um, the glacier forms and then it flows down slope into an area where it might not snow at all or into definitely into a warmer area okay so this is called the zone of accumulation up here this is called the zone of ablation down here 
right? And so what's happening here is the ice is melting, or maybe it's sublimating. Maybe it's going straight from, you know, being solid to being gas. That's what sublimation means without even going through a liquid phase. But it's also melting uh, and whatnot. But here's the trick, right? As long as there's enough supply from this zone of accumulation, it can continue to supply ice to this zone of ablation. And so you could even have a case where this glacial toe here, this terminus, is moving this way, uh, even though it's melting because it's getting supplied with enough um, enough ice in this zone of accumulation, right? So if this is cold enough and wet enough with snow, you can absolutely shove ice down slope um, into this zone of ablation. And if there's enough of it here, the glacier will actually grow. Um, in this zone of ablation because conditions up here are supplying ice at a faster rate than it's being removed down here. Okay, so just because you're standing in front of a glacier doesn't mean that, you know, you're in cold, snowy weather, right? In fact, that, that picture I took, that very first picture I showed of the... Um, of the Athabasca Glacier up there in Canada, I was wearing shorts, okay? I was wearing shorts, I was wearing my, my usual cargo shorts, uh, my hiking boots, and a short sleeve shirt. Um, now, I'm, I'm kind of a fan of cold, but, but still, I was not cold. It was nicely cool, it felt really good. I Honestly, I don't know what the temperature was. My guess is probably in the 40s or maybe 50s um fahrenheit obviously but anyway you know um you know i'm standing there in front of a glacier wearing shorts and a short sleeve shirt going that's pretty cool uh and so and it was not unduly cold i just really wasn't so so you know once again this area down here can be you know pretty dang warm uh and still have a glacier because it's being fed by a being fed from up here Right. And so so just just a little bit of terminology here um, that once again, the leading edge of that glacier is called the toe. OK, so here's the trick that toe, even if the toe of the glacier is moving backward, OK, the ice is still moving forward. I think, I mean, when you think about a glacier, think about, um, you know, I like to think about a conveyor belt. Now, there's no part underneath it where it's moving backwards, so okay. But the top part, anyway, behaves like a conveyor belt, right? Just always moving this way. Now, I can pull that conveyor belt back, okay? But regardless of what the front is doing, the belt is always moving this way, right? And so, yeah, so, so, um, so let let let's uh, let's take a look at this, right? So so you know once again, if you're getting more snow up here in the zone of accumulation, that will push ice down here past the equilibrium line into the zone of ablation. And and it's funny because they label this less ablation. It's not that you get less ablation really. It's that you get more accumulation up here to make up for the ablation. You could have you know the same amount of of ice loss here. Okay, but if you have more snow up here, you're replacing the ice, right? And so what's going to happen is that toe is going to move forward. Okay, now, but if it warms or you get less snow, okay, now, despite the ice moving forward, once again, it's not really more ablation. And it doesn't need to be anyway. If you get less snow, now the ablation is sufficient to cause the glacier to retreat. Right? And then as it does, the equilibrium line moves up. You can see if I go back here, the equilibrium line is all the way down here. Uh, the equilibrium line moves up and the glacier, the body of ice shrinks, right? And so the toe moves this way. The ice is still moving down slope, okay? But the toe is retreating, okay? So, uh, and then um, all the while it's dropping sediment and we'll talk more about that. But let's uh, let's talk about a little bit of terminology. And once again, glaciers were originally described by the French um, in the Alps. Um, and so, um, so the terminology is, is French. And so, um, you know, these areas where glaciers form up in the mountains are called cirques. And you can see a nice one here. Uh, very nice one here, right? This bowl-shaped depression high in the mountain where the glacier really gets its beginning, 
All right, uh, here, uh, a picture from uh, my trip to Canada once again a couple years ago. Uh, and you can see there's a cirque there. There's a cirque there. Not as spectacular as the ones in France, sorry. But there they are. Um, uh, and you can see there's some glacial ice in them. Now, standing where I'm standing here, um, I'm on my way up to the, uh, the ice field. So um, if I turn to my left, uh, looks like this. Oh, sorry, wrong way. <laughs> I hit the left button. <laughs> if I turn to my left, there we go, it looks like this, right? Uh, and literally, that's all I did was turn left. And you can see there's a cirque there. There's a big one there. Uh, there's maybe a smaller one there. But these these bowl shaped depressions, right? That the that the uh, that the um, that the glacier originally formed in. They're called cirques. Now, if I have a cirque here, and I have a cirque right next to it, like I do here. Um, I'm going to get a ridge in between them, okay? And that ridge is called an ariette, and I think that word should that that e should have a little little finger over it, but whatever. Uh, it's called an ariette, right? That's that ridge running down through here, okay? Um, and so the other thing is where you have, let's say, three ariettes meeting. So here's here's a ridge here, here's a ridge here, here's a ridge here. They make these very sharp peaks called horns uh there's a famous one called the matterhorn that you might have heard of uh these um um once again these, these very here i'll show you and i'll show you this picture very very sharp peaks right horns so cirques ariettes and horns right and so long after the glacier is gone Right when there's no more glaciers left in the Alps, you can still look at that landscape, and um and see um that there used to be glaciers there. Right, and glaciers leave behind a lot of signs of their presence. Uh, and and this this erosion of these these alpine glaciers is just one of them. Um, glaciers also make very characteristic U-shaped valleys. Um, you can always tell a glacial valley because it is U-shaped. I mean U-shaped as opposed to V-shaped, right? If you look at the Grand Canyon, you've got very sharp, sharp, <laughs> steeply sloping sides coming down to the Colorado River, okay? That is a classic river V-shaped valley, okay? Glacial valleys, though, like the one you see here, are u-shaped and when you look in places like europe you see them everywhere now it's a little bit more complicated right because a lot of times these u-shaped valleys will have rivers running through them now that's going to make a smaller v-shaped valley on the bottom but whenever you see these u-shaped valleys you know that valley was carved by a glacier Okay, there's a uh, an easy way to see this too. If we look at hanging valleys, right? So if I have you know a large glacier running through, let me let me go. Uh, no, let me not do that. If I have a large glacier running across the screen, and let's say that at some point I had a smaller glacier flowing into it, okay, that small when the, when those glaciers retreat, that's going to leave behind a really big central valley that we are looking across here, okay, but it's also going to leave a smaller valley f kind of flowing into the bigger one, right? This is called a hanging valley. It is a smaller glacial valley where a smaller glacier used to run into a much larger glacier. And so you get this network of glacial valleys. You can also see this one has a river in the middle of it, right? So you're going to get this, this classic glacial U-shaped valley, but with a river overprinted, you know, on the bottom of it. And that's very common. I mean, glaciers are frozen um, frozen water but they're they're melting and so there's a lot of there's a lot of liquid water associated with them as well now if i take now this this glacial valley here is flooded you can see we're looking across it and there's water in it right when you flood a glacial valley like that it's called a fjord and you may have heard uh, <laughs> if you're a fan of Monty Python and the parrot sketch, you know you you heard you know he's painting for the fjords. Um, this is what a fjord is. I don't know what he means by painting. I guess he misses the fjords. Why a parrot would miss some fjords, I don't know. But anyway, um, this is a flooded glacial valley. 
right? And so, uh, you know, a nice U-shaped valley that is filled with water, usually from, from the sea, right? These provide really good uh, um, waterways to reach the interior of a country. Those fjords are deep. Uh, you know, a lot of the the the, the uh, Norwegian Scandinavian countries around the North Atlantic are great shipbuilding countries uh, because they can build them relatively far, quote unquote, inland, and then still float them uh, into the North Sea uh, because there's plenty of draft um, in these fjords, and so it's a it's a very very valuable resource. Plus, they're beautiful. I mean, they sail cruise ships up in these things all the time uh it's just they they are just beautiful and they are a great national resource they they build oil rigs um and float them down these fjords out into the um out into the uh, the north sea so uh they are a great resource um for these scandinavian countries um up there that have these fjords and and have access to the sea through them um and so yeah uh and so um also we we, we need to think a little bit about sediment size or sediment here's the thing glaciers carry a lot of sediment they really do um and they drop it i mean you know it is i'm going to show you a picture here in a minute it's a, a picture of a conveyor belt right they, they move the sediment down slope and they just drop it in piles um glacial sediment is let's go but let's think back to our let me get a drink of water here real quick uh, much better um Glacial sediment is unsorted, not poorly sorted, unsorted. You have everything from boulders the size of a small house, some of them the size of a large house, uh, to, you know, normal size boulders, to pebbles, to sand, to silt, all of it, okay, mixed in, just mixed in. Uh, glacial sediment is, is like that. It, it's everything. Right. And, and, you know, we really do, when we think about these, we think about conveyor belts. <laughs> okay, <laughs> You drop a bunch of rock, it moves, it makes a pile, right? Now, that pile is called the end moraine. That, that's the last pile of sediment uh, that the glacier dropped the furthest, in, in the case of the northern hemisphere, the further south it is, right? Long Island, New York that New York City sits on is the terminal moraine from the last glacial interval. That island is there and because of glaciers. It is it is glacial sediment. Okay. Um so that, that, that sediment is always transported in one direction. If that ice, you know, sits there for any time at all, all that, all that, all that sediment uh, is going to, is going to fall out. Okay. I'll show you some moraines here in a second, but let's talk about one more thing that's kind of fun. Um, and that is the whole idea of a glacial erratic, right? An erratic is a boulder, you know, or a rock. It doesn't really need to be a boulder. We could just say a rock, but boulders are more fun. Um, that has been, you know, moved in by the glacier and dropped there. Just, just boom, there, rock, right? It has nothing to do with the underlying bedrock, right? It is an entirely different rock uh, than the underlying bedrock. And so if you don't know it's an erratic, Oh boy, uh, that could be a problem. <laughs> that could really be a problem. Here's an erratic. Um, the, the, the fun thing about it is it's sitting on top of this bedrock. See these scrapes in the bedrock? Those are striations. Uh, that's where the bottom of the ice has picked up pebbles and they've ground their way into the bedrock. And I believe we talked about striations when we originally talked about glaciers way back when we were doing plate tectonics, right? And so, yeah, here's some erratics. Um, um, I spotted these when I was working, once again, uh, in, in Canada, in the Alberta Badlands. Uh, and th there's a few things going on here. Okay, first of all, uh, see this grass over here? That is glacial till. Okay, that is from the last glacial interval. Uh, it is sitting on top of rock. That is, This is the Horseshoe Canyon formation, this rock over here. This rock over here, that white rock right there matches that white rock right there. This is the Horseshoe Canyon formation. It is about 70 million years old. Okay, so we have an unconformity here, right? We've got a 70 million year old rock here and some, I don't know, 
10,000 year old um, sediment on top of it, right? So, so I know glaciers were in this area, and in fact, a lot of this was carved out by by glacial meltwater. But look at these rocks. I know they don't look like much, but they don't belong there. <laughs> they do not belong there. They do not match this rock, any of this rock, any of this rock. They do not belong there. Okay, they are glacial erratics. I was walking along, I'm looking for fossils, and I spot these, and I'm like. What the heck, right? Because you know, you, you know, you're in the field. You've got these, you know, geologist senses that you know kick in, and um, you know, it's like wait, 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 no, 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 that that, that does not belong here, right? And sure enough, they don't. They, they they're unlike anything around them, and they were brought in by the glaciers, the same glaciers that made this glacial sediment here, which is called till, by the way, and so um. And so, yeah, I just noticed something on my next slide I want to fix. I will be right back, y'all. I probably could have just hit pause and fixed that, and y'all would never have known. But anyway, glacial erratics are kind of fun. Let, let's take a look at some more. Um, uh, let's see. Here we go. Uh, go to New England. You know, upstate New York, New Hampshire, Vermont, Maine. Go to New England, okay? Um, you'll see stone walls everywhere okay absolutely everywhere and england is known for these heck robert frost wrote a poem about stone walls um you know they are there are literally thousands of miles of stone wall in england they are famous for their stone walls right and there's all i mean google new it not england sorry new england google new england stone wall sometime and bask in the glory of these beautiful pictures of you know fall leaves and stone walls and you know and, and all this stuff and when you look at them carefully there's a lot of different rocks here there's a lot of different rocks here here's a guy who a person who i don't know cemented them together with mud or something but right there's a lot of different kinds of rocks here and as i said they are famous for these they really are so why i mean what why, why are they why are they i mean this seems like an awful lot of effort to go through for something that just kind of looks pretty when you take a picture of it or something like that and wouldn't it be easier to build wood fences like everyone else does um i mean you've got to clear the land to farm it anyway um why are you hauling rocks um up to make walls well here's the trick right <laughs> if you're gonna farm in new england you're gonna have to get rid of the rocks you are going to hit rocks. You ask a New England farmer what they grow, and they are as likely to tell you rocks as anything else. Uh, those fields are full of rocks, and you have to get rid of them. So what do you do? Well, you don't haul them far. You just haul them to the edge of your field and build a little stone wall out of them. You know, it looks all nice and pretty and tony, and it'll keep your cows out of your corn or whatever. Um... And, yeah, they're not building stone walls because they really like stone walls. They're building stone walls because they have to have something to do with all of the glacial erratics they are pulling out of their fields, right? Um, you know, every year, more of them seem to come up. It's just like I said, you ask a New England farmer what they grow, and they are as likely to tell you rocks as anything. Uh, we, this is obviously not a problem we have in Florida. Um, you know, we, we don't have, you know, fields full of rocks and things. We have other issues in Florida, but not this one. So, so if you ever do go to New England, you know, upstate New York, um, New Hampshire, Vermont, uh, Massachusetts, Maine, all that area up there, it's beautiful go sometime it's really pretty and you're gonna see a lot of these stone walls and they're not there because farmers like building stone walls they're there because they have to have somewhere to put the glacial erratics um i mentioned the word moraine um before and uh this is a word that we use for just you know um sediment right unsorted sediment dumped by a glacier there's a couple of different kinds uh first of all uh you know you'll get um lateral moraines right as the ice flows what it will do is it'll scrape sediment from the uh from the, the, the canyon wall here if you want to call it a canyon right the, the wall there right and that that creates a um 
and that creates a, a, a pile of sediment on the edge of the ice. That's called a lateral moraine, right? So here's a lateral moraine here. Don't know why they labeled an anonymous rock fall there, but okay. Here's a lateral moraine over here, right? Now, you can see what happens though, right? And we saw that we see this in this picture, um, and we, we saw it on the Google Earth image, right? Where this, you know, where you have one glacier flowing into another right these this lateral moraine here and this lateral moraine here turn into this medial moraine here right running down the center of the glacier uh, and that is sourced from these two lateral moraines and you can see that very clearly over here right this really looks like a almost like a photograph of that but you can see you got a lateral moraine running here can't see it as well but you got another lateral moraine running here and those two come together and turn into a medial moraine right here's another medial moraine that probably formed up um slope um, when two two glaciers came together to make this glacier right and so uh so a lot of times you'll get these stripes um on the glacier there's you know there's another one there's another one right where where you know glaciers have flown together kind of like um kind of like um uh rivers flowing together only in the case of a glacier you have a record of that um in the form of these uh, lateral and medial moraines there's a lot of landforms um associated with glaciers uh, a lot of them um you know you've got so you know if i've got ice flowing down here i've got two uh two two lobes coming together maybe i've got a wet bottom glacier so i've got water flowing out from underneath here um there's there's um there's uh, a lot of things that happen here or quite a few things that happen here anyway um first of all you do have in moraines and terminal moraines right so uh, a terminal moraine is the furthest south the glacier went okay and so you can see here um here is this terminal moraine right this this is this is the pile of sediment that represents you know the furthest south that glacier went if you think once again i told you about long island um uh, New York, that, that's the terminal moraine from the last glacial interval. In moraines are just kind of, um, you know, um, moraines that are back here uh, that form when the glacier may be paused and then went back right and so so if the glacier stops for you know a few years you're going to get another moraine uh that we just call an in moraine it's not the terminal one it's not the last one but it's you know um another one where the glacier paused um and then recessional moraines form as the glacier retreats right as the glacier retreats it drops sediment as it goes um drumlins are these glacial hills you can see them here Drumlins are steeper on one side and shallower on the other. They are formed by this ice flowing over um, these uh, this sediment. It piles up these drumlins. They are steeper on the up um, stream side relative to the ice. So the ice is moving this way. The drumlin is steeper on that side, shallower on that side. Right. Um, as the ice retreats, you will get pieces of it that fall off um so you got this big chunk of ice and then you got all of this glacial sediment filling in around that chunk of ice okay um the ice melts and what you're left with is a hole that will fill in with water and be a lake right these are called kettle lakes and if you go to the american midwest let's say um minnesota wisconsin that area um you will see thousands of these um they are everywhere because as that last glacier retreated off of north america it left behind a lot of chunks of ice that would you know be surrounded by sediment then that ice would melt leaving you with a lake and there are thousands of them up there uh they're really pretty uh but you know when you look at you know, when you look at florida and you see a whole bunch of lakes or sinkholes okay when you look at you know minnesota and you see a whole bunch of lakes they're kettle lakes from the glaciers okay and then finally uh eskers 
a lot of times you'll have uh, rivers flowing underneath these glaciers. Uh, and so you'll get a deposit of river sediment under the glacier. Um, and that, that, that river sediment that formed underneath that glacier is called an esker. Um, <laughs> uh, if you go to Publix and buy some bottled water, you will find a bottled water named Esker, uh, which I just think is funny because an Esker is a big pile of dirt under a glacier. So, but I guess it sounds whatever. So anyway, um, so yeah, so, uh, you know, if you go to New England, you go to places that have been glaciated, you see these landforms here. Uh, once again, if we go back to last summer, this is the terminal moraine. Um, from the Athabasca Glacier. So the glacier here is off to my left as I took this picture. Here is this big pile of sediment uh, that was the furthest that that glacier went. Um, and so you just get all these rocks piled together. And this, this is what glacial sediment looks like. Here's one of the medial moraines from that glacier. Um, and I took this picture just because it shows, okay, first of all, it shows some really nice striations in this rock. You can see what direction this glacier was moving. It was moving that away. Okay, but also, actually that away, down slope. <laughs> um, but also, see all the, see, see the diversity of rocks. I mean, there's just, I mean, you could make a really nice rock collection just standing here and picking up rocks you get all kinds of different stuff carried by that glacier um i mentioned long island all right uh yeah <laughs> okay um so and if you look you can see so once again the end range form at the stable toe but the terminal moraine is the farthest that it went right and the recessional moraines form back as that retreating ice maybe stalls a little bit and piles sediment up but you can see here's long island and here is, you know, here's, you know, the yellow is actually exposed moraine. Uh, and, and this, you know, connects nicely here with Marshall's Vineyard and Cape Cod, right? All the, this whole complex, Nantucket too, this whole complex is, is terminal moraine um, from, from the furthest extent here, at least, um, of the last glacial interval, dropping all that stuff. So, um, okay, so... Um, we are currently not in a glacial interval. We are, uh, we have come out of a glacial interval. Our climate stabilized, and then with the onset of the industrial revolution and burning fossil fuels, temperatures are shooting upward, and we are melting glaciers. Um, but absent that, what are the causes? of glaciation why is it that sometimes there are glaciers and sometimes there are not and sometimes we're somewhere in between well okay so what causes this well a few things uh first of all you know yeah changes in the earth's atmosphere uh can make a difference there is a degree of natural variation in the amount of carbon dioxide um in our planet on our in our planet's atmosphere and that can absolutely make a difference now let's be clear the the increase in carbon dioxide that we are currently causing far exceeds <laughs> anything natural okay in fact i'm going to post a graphic for you um, on my courses that kind of drives this home a little bit but yeah in the long term over you know hundreds of millions of years yes the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere does vary. And I'll show you a graph here in just a second. Uh, the position of the continents matters, though, right? We studied, con we studied continental drift. We studied plate tectonics, right? We know that the continents move. Um, and so if you don't have a continent at or near the pole, you're not going to get glaciers, right? Freezing seawater is not glaciers. That's sea ice. That's a different thing. So you need a continent, a continent, a continent, or continents, or whatever, at or near the poles, right? Um, Antarctica is a continent that is currently covered with glaciers. It's sitting on the South Pole, right? And, you know, northern Canada, Greenland, same thing, not at the North Pole, but near enough to it, okay? There are some interesting questions about uh, the, the sun's energy output, um, which could be interesting. Um, we're not sure about that, though. It's kind of a, kind of a thing. Sorry, I needed some water. Um, and then there is another fascinating thing that goes on. 
something called Milankovitch cycles. Uh, these are this is where astronomy and geology kind of overlap. Uh, there are long cycle changes in the Earth's orbital orbital parameters um, that. Um, that could be helping to drive glaciation. So let's take a look. So yeah, uh, you know, um, the amount of carbon dioxide in the air does change over millions of years. Um, and you can see, you know, back here in the Paleozoic, there's a lot more carbon dioxide in the air than there is today. Uh, then it drops for various and sundry reasons, and then it rises, and then it kind of drops through the Mesozoic into the Cenozoic. Um, you know, our current increase in carbon dioxide is, is so recent it would not show up on this graph so so um but yeah it does vary and as it does um you know the temperature varies uh and and so yeah so the amount of glaciation varies as well um and you can you can see you know, a pretty good correlation between temperature and carbon dioxide you can see here as the co2 goes down the temperature goes down it takes a little while to respond co2 goes up temperature goes up uh, we can see an interesting little dip in temperature here that doesn't seem to correspond with carbon dioxide but we can also see that as co2 goes down here once again a little bit of lag time temperature goes down right it's not going to be a you know, straight on correlation, uh, but you know, you can see that they do, you know, they do go together. Uh, and so, yeah, so, so yeah, long-term, you know, fluctuations in the amount of carbon dioxide can matter, right? It also matters though, where the continents are, right? And you need, um, you need for um, continents to be at or near the poles uh, for there to be glaciation. For that matter, you need continents, right? So, so you know, we go back too far, you're not going to get any glaciation because there's just no continents. So that also matters. Solar output is an interesting kind of a thing. Um, you know, uh, the, the Marauder Minimum, uh, which is a um, which was a, a lower level of solar, solar output, um, um, between 1650 and 1700, uh, corresponded with a um, with a uh, a small ice age called the Little Ice Age. Um, it, you know, these things are complicated, and so people like to use sunspots as a uh, as a um, a proxy for solar output, which works pretty well. Uh, sunspots have a roughly 10 or 11 year cycle, which you can see here. Um, and you can see here when there were fewer sunspots, uh, the temperature got cooler. Uh, but there are also lots of reasons temperatures get cooler. It's really difficult to sort this stuff out. Um, it, it really truly is. And so, uh, and by the way, that's not the 10 year cycle you're seeing there. The 10 year cycle is going to be within the, that larger cycle. Sunspots, um, graphs are like a fractal or something weird like that. So anyway, um, but, um, but it, it is an interesting idea. Uh, now, now, interestingly, lately, um, the, the amount of solar activity has not been increasing at all. Uh, but the temperatures have been, and once again, this doesn't show our current increase because the scale is just not right for it. So, so, anyway uh okay so so solar output you know definitely kind of a thing uh but also and and here's my slide full of words my apologies um milankovitch cycles Th this is a thing that geologists really concentrate on because this makes a lot of sense um you know the earth's orbit around the sun for example is not a circle it is an ellipse and the shape of that ellipse varies um on the order of every hundred thousand years, and so uh, when we're fur you know when the ellipse is more elliptical, and we have these periods where we're further from the sun, that could be um, that could be um, causing uh, helping to trigger. There's a, there's the words helping to trigger glacial intervals, right? The angle uh, that the Earth makes with respect to its orbit um, also. Um, uh, changes and so uh, and and what I mean by that is that the um, you know the Earth's axis is tilted 23 and a half degrees relative to the plane that it orbits the Earth and well that 23 and a half degrees changes it can change by about a degree and a half every 44,000 years and so that can also um, cause uh, you know more intense winters more intense summers but during those more intense winters in northern areas you can get glacials uh, glacial intervals um, happen you can what are, what are the words you get trigger glacial intervals there we go and then precession the earth if you imagine a top spinning 
um, it you know the axis that it's spinning on once it starts to slow down a little bit that axis will lean over and then it will move around that motion is called precession and I, I, you can't see me but I'm sitting here doing this with my finger okay so, but anyway um, so so combine that obliquity that that tilt of the Earth's axis of rotation with precession that would be the movement of the Earth's axis of rotation. Um, and you get another variable. Now, Milankovic felt like none of these are in and of themselves enough to trigger a glacial interval. But, um, but you know, if everything goes, you know, wrong or right, depending on your point of view, at once, then you can get a glacial interval, right? If you if you if you have a highly eccentric orbit, and then you know the the obliquity is right and the precession is right, suddenly boom you get a uh, you know you get a um you trigger a glacial a glacial interval and so this is something that geologists really concentrate on uh you know we can we can go we can tell when there have been glaciers we can look at you know evidence from deep sea cores and all kinds of things and see that yeah you, know, you can tell when there's a glacial interval and they correspond with these astronomical Milankovitch cycles um this is a time when i really needed some pictures of these things but i think you get the idea um if not google them up uh look at some pictures uh yeah um okay so so uh, there have been um, several North American glacial intervals, but but the three most recent um, from uh, and and these these are on here with different colors. Don't worry, I'm not, I don't I'm not going to make him map these or anything weird like that. Okay, but we can see that um, that you know there was an Illinoisan glacial interval uh, which was described um, oddly enough originally from the state of well Illinois uh, from about 300,000 to uh, three, yeah 300,000 to about 130,000 years ago right and then on top of that um, you got another glacial interval called the Sangamonian that was from about 125 to about 75,000 years ago. And then the most recent called the Wisconsin glacial interval named after, well, Wisconsin, that's going to be the yellow on here. Okay. Um, from about 70,000 to about 10,000 years ago. And that was the last glacial interval okay and on this map um um you know it's it's yellow right and you can see that the yellow i know i keep harping on this i just think it's fun you can see the yellow comes right down there to new york and stops <laughs> so, so if you're doing geology anywhere up in here new england new york upper pennsylvania over here northern ohio uh you know uh, you know wisconsin uh you know etc cetera, etc cetera, uh you have to be aware that you know you're gonna have to dig through glacial sediments before you get to the rock um and so yeah now um and i'll, I'll show you some maps here in a minute that drive this home a little bit better um but this this did not Florida was affected by this too because here's the thing not directly by the glaciers but if you shove this much ice down right that displaces a lot of the animals and things and plants and everything that were living there right and so um and so they're going to get shoved southward too right and the other th and here's the other thing when you make all this ice on north america that lowers sea level now can't see it on here but panama becomes a land bridge between south america and north america and you get a lot of migration so you get a lot of migration of animals southward getting pushed by the ice you get a lot of migration of animals northward just because they can um and you know and so yeah so you know you start looking at vertebrate fossils in florida and you get some really fascinating stuff here's a mammoth uh which we have i mean you find mammoth fossils i found mammoth fossils and rivers and stuff all over florida um you know things like you know uh lots of saber-toothed cats and, and these these big birds called terror birds um i don't honestly know the scientific name for them terror bird is just too much fun um and then you know these armadillos the size of you know cars um running around you know, a lot you know you, you look at the pleistocene flora and fauna of florida and it is amazing uh because 
so many things were being pushed southward and so many things coming up from the north and so we get all kinds of really fascinating fossils right here in florida as a result of these glacial intervals i mentioned um you know something about you know be aware you're digging through um glacial sediments yeah you are look don't worry about any of this don't, just don't 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 just look at the picture this is the surface geology in minnesota okay so this is what if you're walking along these are the the rocks and the sediment deposits that you are going to see and you can see as you know i, now I told you to ignore this before but just look very briefly moraine 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 till moraine moraine uh mor right, all till tills glacial sediment right all all just to, just about all of this there's the pine city in moraine there's the pine city i mean there's, there's all kinds of stuff here right most of this is glacial right if you look at this, so if you're interested in the bedrock geology of minnesota it is not expressed at the surface right that, that's all glacial here's what the bedrock geology of minnesota looks like it looks nothing like the surface geology nothing nothing at all right you got to get through all of the i mean this is all pre-cambrian stuff archean cambrian ordovician devonian there's a little bit of cretaceous but most most of this is really old proterozoic this is this is all pre-cambrian bedrock most of it i mean it's it's all very very old and sitting on top of that very very old rock is all of this glacial sediment and so yeah if you're doing bedrock geology you're gonna have to dig through that glacial stuff you, you just you just are so yeah so um now florida by the way looks like that <laughs> and the nice thing about florida is if you want to know what the bedrock is reach down and pick up a rock <laughs> you know, odds are it came from the bedrock uh it's, it's not difficult to map um usual i mean there, there's the usual problems but but you don't have that problem you certainly don't now one problem that we do have in florida moving on from glaciers using florida as this nice transition um we are famous for karst topography karst topography is a landscape that has been shaped by the dissolution of bedrock right by the groundwater and so uh you know you have groundwater that is a little bit acidic either it either fell from the sky that way or in our case a lot of times it runs through our acidic soil um and ends up being a bit acidic and you know our bedrock is limestone which is very subject to dissolution and so give it some time and geologically it doesn't take that long uh that bedrock will dissolve right and so now we get all these features that we um that we are familiar with here in florida right we got a lot of caves a lot of them underwater um i've dove a few of them it's wildly dangerous and i got smart and stopped doing that but <laughs> i am actually certified to do it but i just choose not to anymore um you know you got a lot of caves you got a lot of sinkholes i mean oh my gosh you i mean you know <laughs> go over to lakeland right lakeland is called lakeland because there's all kinds of lakes and they're all sinkholes they are almost all sinkholes and of course florida is famous for its springs right beautiful springs um jenny springs morrison springs wakala springs i mean choose your favorite area and there will be a spring in it i can almost guarantee you and they are wonderful and they are beautiful um i belong to several hiking groups on on facebook and you know we get people from other places hiking in florida and they're always like where are the waterfalls and we're like yeah not so much for the waterfalls but the springs oh my gosh the springs uh they 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 really are just beautiful the other thing that was on that previous slide was uh, a disappearing uh, stream which is kind of fun they flow along and then they go underground <laughs> right? and, they, and they flow along underground and then they come back out uh and so you know you're tracing a stream on a map and suddenly or you're walking it even and suddenly it just goes away uh because yeah it went underground uh so springs um caves lots of caves beautiful caves florida caverns not underwater 
really cool go check it out it's up in the north north part of florida right? there's lots of cool stuff um lots of really interesting stuff here's a disappearing stream it, it doesn't look like much okay it, i i know it doesn't look like much but but this stream is flowing this way uh and so it just bloop goes right underground right we are we have a lot of karst uh there's a lot of karst in kentucky um anywhere where you have a um um a a dissolvable bedrock usually limestone um, you will get this karst with a K topography, and we all know about the hazards of sinkholes. I mean, you know, they occasionally you'll get one opening up, and you know what happens there. Of course, is you have a cave underground, and it's close enough to the surface that the that the roof collapses, right? And so now you've got a hole, uh, where before you had a cave. Uh, and sometimes this can happen quickly. Sometimes it happens slowly. Um, a, an interesting variation on karst topography. Uh, tower karst. This is in China. Um, and, you know, it's funny because European explorers, when they, you know, first went to China, they brought back all this artwork showing these really, really steep hills. And, um, you know, they bring this artwork back to China and people are going, oh, well, that's just a stylized, you know, drawing. They're not really like that, you know, and it's sort of like, actually, they are. <laughs> and so um, this is once again, this is called Tower Karst. And what you're seeing here is let's just look at this one right here. This is kind of a reverse sinkhole. In other words, if a sinkhole is where the bedrock was particularly susceptible to dissolution, and so you made a cave, and then the cave collapsed, and you made a sinkhole. Here, the rock is particularly resistant to dissolution, right? And so this, you know, you see all these hills are about the same height. That used to be the ground surface. Right? And then all around this more resistant rock, you dissolved away the bedrock. And so, so uh, forming, you know, like I said, I, I kind of like to think of these as reverse sinkholes. It kind of makes a little bit more sense. But it makes these very steep hills and then, you know, very good farmland around them. And so, um, tower karst. Uh, phenomenal stuff in some regions of China. Don't know of anywhere else where they'd get this, uh, but it is definitely in China. I would love to visit some tower cars someday. It would be fascinating. Um, things we can visit, you know, obviously our sinkholes and things, but we need to think a bit about groundwater in the time we have left because here in Florida, we rely a great deal on groundwater. Right, that's where we get our fresh water from. Uh, we don't usually get it from reservoirs or rainwater or anything like that. We pump it out of the ground. Okay, now um, an area uh, where you can pump groundwater out of the ground is called an aquifer. And uh, the aquifer that we use is called the Floridan Aquifer. And you can see it here. It extends all through Florida, up into Georgia, South Carolina, over into Alabama. I want to say it goes over, it, obviously it goes over into Mississippi a bit. But this is, this is where we get our water from, our fresh water. Fresh water to drink, fresh water to grow food. All the things we use fresh water for are, are getting pumped out of this aquifer. Now, um, you know, near the shore, that gets really tricky because if you pump too much fresh water out, you're going to start pumping salt water. Salt water is not nearly as useful as fresh water. It's just not as we know. So there's a little bit of terminology we want. Uh, first of all, porosity and permeability. So porosity is poor space in the rock, right? It's empty space in the rock um, where you can, um, th that can be filled with water. Okay, so you can see here, if you have some rounded grains, you know, you're going to get a lot of empty space in there. If you have a poorly um, sorted sediment, eh, you're not going to get as much porosity because those empty areas fill in with the smaller things, right? A lot of times you have, well, you know, if you think about something like a, um, um, oh, heck, oh, let's see, a, um, a scoria, right, where you, you know, or a vesicular igneous rock where you've got a lot of air bubbles and things like that, um, you're going to have a lot of porosity 
Okay, but here's the trick. It's not connected, right? The extent to which the proxy is connected is permeability, right? You might have a lot of holes in the rock, and they might even be filled with water. You're not going to be pumping water out of there, right? Because it's not connected, right? What you need you know, in order to have an aquifer, you need both porosity and permeability, right? Um, you know, granites usually make terrible um, aquifers, okay, because they don't have a lot of porosity. Now, if they're fractured, they might have a little bit. Um, and if they're fractured a lot and those fractures overlap, you, you, but, but really, honestly, y'all, not really, <laughs> okay? I mean, not, not, not really, okay? And so, but here in Florida, we have a combination of a lot of pore space in that limestone and a lot of it is connected. So you can pump water out of it pretty easily, okay? Little bit of terminology, and then I'll show you a picture. Uh, an aquifer, that is a rock or sediment that has good porosity, good permeability. Right? That's where we're going to pump our water from. Um, an aquaclude is the opposite of an aquifer. An aquaclude is a rock that water won't flow through. Right? Think most igneous rocks. <laughs> Right. Uh, most, you know, honestly, metamorphic rocks too, right? But then also things like shales, you're not going to get a whole lot of water going through a shale. You're just not, right? And so, so you know, most rocks are aquacludes, right? Most rocks, you don't get groundwater. The upper surface of that aquifer is called the water table, right? That's where if you're drilling, that's where you're going to hit that water for the first time and the very important concept the recharge zone this is the area where water is added to the aquifer okay um you want to be really careful with your recharge zone because if you dump a bunch of bad things on the ground and that washes into the aquifer, oh boy, right now you've got a problem. Um, now the Florida aquifer, we are pretty lucky. The whole thing is a recharge zone. It just recharges from the top. Right, it just you know it rains that water goes down to the aquifer, so we don't have a limited recharge zone, which is good. That that's very good. Um, Austin, Texas, not so lucky. I'll show you them here in a minute. So let's look at let's look at a picture of some of these concepts. So so uh, so here we have you know here we have uh, what we would call an unconfined aquifer, right? That's going to be uh, an aquifer uh, without an aquaclude on either side of it. This is kind of what we have here in Florida, right? And so you, you can drill down into that water table, which is that, you know, the top of the top of the aquifer, and you pump water out. As long as you don't pump too much, you're good. Don't pump too much. <laughs> okay, just don't do that. Because uh, they, they can be, they can be, um, they can be depleted. Um, uh, here we have a confined aquifer, right, where where you've got, you know, uh, an aquaclude here and an aquaclude below it. And so now, um, here's your aquifer. It's not going to recharge just right here, right? It's going to recharge. You can see it's got a confined recharge area up in here, okay? Um, and so, you know, water falls and it recharges the aquifer there. So you want to be really careful what you do here. Uh, because in this case, right, you could, you could contaminate your entire aquifer, uh, just by, you know, a good fuel spill up here or something. And, and suddenly you got a problem. You got a big problem. Okay. Um, so, um, this actually creates a pressure head where, uh, if you're right here, you can just, you know, if you're far enough up, you, you can just, um, pump, uh, no, sorry, eh, drill a hole. <laughs> okay. And water will flow. Uh, when it does that, that's called an artesian well. If you're further down here, the pressure is not as much, and you're still going to have to pump. Pumping spine, just make sure you be really careful what you do up here. Now, once again, in Florida, we have an unconfined. The Florida aquifer is a largely unconfined aquifer, so uh, we don't. You don't hear a lot of people worrying too much about recharge um, in um, in in uh, in Florida's aquifers because it's 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 not that much of a problem, not really. Um, you hear a lot about saltwater intrusion, by the way, in Florida because if you are near the coast and you you pump too much, you'll suck salt water up in your up in your pump, um, and that's bad, right? That that's very very bad. So you want to be really careful about what you do near the coast with pumping groundwater because it can it can cause a problem. I mentioned. Um, 
I mentioned, um, I mentioned, uh, um, sorry, <laughs> I mentioned Austin, uh, and yeah, Austin, uh, Austin, San Antonio region of Texas, uh, there's a, there, there's a thing going on here, uh, first of all, um, the, the aquifer, um, is actually this whole blue area here, uh, the problem, though, is that the green is the recharge area, right, and so, and look at where San Antonio and Austin are. They're right in that recharge zone. Uh, and so they have to be really very careful about what they do here uh, in terms of content. Because you can, you can contaminate this entire aquifer just with Austin and San Antonio. And that would be very very bad uh because this is where people are getting their water right they're getting it here from i mean they also have some reservoirs here but they have issues too uh, and you, you can't contaminate your reservoir either so uh so you'll be very very careful uh with what you do in these recharge zones and i think i have a picture if i don't i'll tell you now i think i have a picture though you drive around austin san antonio and there are signs that say you are in the edwards aquifer recharge zone don't dump stuff right don't be careful uh because you know we all depend on this aquifer so um so there there are issues with groundwater we can imagine um talked about some of them but um right contamination is a problem urban runoff right uh you know cities there's lots of chemicals on those roads those chemicals get washed in you know and all, i mean all just everything that goes on in cities right you know uh, you can just you can just imagine uh, everything that could wash um, into an aquifer uh, in a city. Um, farm runoff is also a problem. Oh my gosh! Right? I mean. Um, Look, I eat too, and I get it. But you know, you you dump all this fertilizer on these fields, um, and that washes. You know, if it doesn't get taken up by the plants, that washes into the the uh, the, the, the aquifer as well. That can be a problem. Um, around here, and by here I mean where y'all are. <laughs> Actually, I'm in North Carolina. Where I am too. Golf course runoff. Right. I mean, you know, they fertilize that grass an insane amount. Um, and um, uh, a lot of that runs off. And, you know, it, it's funny because I, I actually had a friend in graduate school who was got a Ph.D. in turf grass. Yes, turf grass. Um, and, you know, he was constantly pleading with golf course managers to use less fertilizer. Because if the fertilizer is running off, it's wasted. Right? If you spend, I don't know, $10,000 on fertilizer and half of it runs off the golf course, that means you're spending twice as much as you need to on fertilizer. Uh, but, you know, they don't... They... <sighs> They don't think that way. They, you know, they're just like, more's better, more's better. And, you know, I teamed up with him, and we did a little project testing water around golf courses. And, oh, my gosh, it was insane, uh, the stuff that was running off. And once again, it's not even in their best interest. They could be, you know, spending less money, using less fertilizer, doing less damage around them. But they, they just they just don't do that. But anyway, uh, overuse is a problem. Oh, my gosh, overuse. Let me show you this. And I'll come back to saltwater intrusion, which I've already mentioned. Actually, I'll go on to it because i got a picture. This is the Ogallala Aquifer, also known as the High Plains Aquifer. Um and uh, so, so North Texas, you can see Oklahoma, Kansas, South Dakota, and you can see, uh, you know, uh, this is how thick it is, was in 1997, okay, mostly thick up here, but yeah, 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 and then, so here it is now, um, and we can see that, you know, the way this is color-coded is in change, okay? And so the gray means that there really hasn't been much change. So there hasn't been much change up here, which is good because there's a lot of water there. But look down here. Look at all this red, right, where, where it's basically gone. Okay, it is essentially gone. And so as, and I don't know what year, 90, 90, 80 to 95, so this is pretty old. Um, they are pulling water out of the Ogallala Aquifer, or let's call it the High Plains Aquifer, overwhelmingly faster than they're putting it in right almost the best i mean the blue is increased but there's not much of that at all basically the best you can hope for is not changing uh 
but most of it is going down. They are they are pulling water out of this aquifer faster than it's being recharged. Right? That is a bad way to do that, right? Because you know um, it's going to go away. It's just, you you cannot continue to pull water out of an aquifer faster than it goes back. You you just can't do that. And so um, now we don't have. I don't think I have not checked lately. Um, boy, with Florida's growth, who knows? I don't think the Florida aquifer has this problem, but I might be wrong. I really could be wrong. Um, but but we do have a problem um, with um, with uh, saltwater intrusion. You know, because let's face it, people don't come to Florida to live in the middle of the state, right? They come to Florida to live on the beach. <laughs> okay, and so so when you do that, though, so that means that our highest, you know, water need. Okay, maybe not because the Sierra State's a lot of agriculture, but anyway, um, but you know, near the beach, when you when you build a well and you start to pump, you make what's called a cone of depression in the water table. The water table goes down. Water table goes down. Right, that sucks that salt water up. And if you keep this up, you will end up with a well that is useless because it is pumping salt water. Uh, and yeah, okay. Uh, this we're uh, I know they had this problem down in Cape Coral, uh, Southwest Florida. They're having this problem. Uh, southeastern Florida. I think they get a lot of their water from the Everglades or something. I don't know, but anyway. Um, so th this is this you know as Florida's population grows especially near the shore, uh, that's going to be a problem. That is really going to be a problem. Uh, one other thing that was over here that I didn't mention, let me just mention it, um, lust. Leaking underground storage tanks, right? Uh, you've got, you know, a lot of old chemical plants, but also just gas stations, uh, you know, with these old metal tanks, uh, and, you know, the gas station closes down or whatever, and that tank just disintegrates underground, and whatever was in it gets into that groundwater, and it is so hard to get it out, um, groundwater flows downstream, down, down slope, uh, mirror, the, the water table mirrors the um, the ground surface and, and the water flows down slope. And so you can easily predict what direction the, the, what the contaminant's going to be going, but knowing where it's going and getting it out of the water, or getting out of the ground, or out of the water, the ground, getting it out is a whole other thing. Uh, it's a problem. And there is a whole government fund called a super fund uh, set up just to mitigate this stuff. Uh, there's a lot of geologists, hydrogeologists, who make their living uh, mitigating these leaky underground storage tanks. I talked about overuse with the um, the High Plains Aquifer, talked about saltwater intrusion, showed you pictures, and I will just leave you with this picture. Um, now, sure enough, you're inside the Edwards, Edwards Aquifer, environmentally sensitive. Please don't change your oil and dump it on the ground here. Uh, that would be bad. So, anyway, groundwater. Um, hydrogeology, it's a whole thing. Uh, people take entire classes on it. People spend their entire careers on it. Same thing with glaciers. There are glacial geologists all over the place, especially in Europe. Um, that's a big deal in Europe. They love their glaciers over in Europe. Okay, that's it. That's what I got. So, I'll get this uploaded. And um, I'll get this uploaded. All right. Y'all take care. Bye-bye.